This is one of a series of eight films featuring some of the early pioneers of quality improvement in the NHS, who share their personal stories and the practical wisdom gained from leading improvement when it was still a niche activity. The idea for the films was originally conceived during a conversation between Peter Wilcock and Helen Bevan about capturing the legacy of early improvement leaders and it was given life by the publication of the National Framework for Action on Improvement and Leadership Development. I've been privileged to have met all of the leaders featured in this series of films early on in my own improvement career, and so I found it fascinating hearing their reflections as they look back on their experiences. We hope that their stories will make a powerful contribution, not only to those of you implementing the new National Framework, but to everyone aspiring to improve healthcare. What got you personally involved in quality improvement? How did you first come across and learn about it? My first introduction to quality improvement in healthcare I came uh, during the most troubled time financially the NHS had before this uh, present financial uh, uh, crisis, and that was um, during the early 1990s. And um, uh, Brian Edwards, who was then the general manager of Trent Regional Health Authority, had gone to a quality improvement um, um, course in the States. And he came back and brought together all the, um, uh, the chief executives in Trent Region and uh, described some of the um, extraordinary results that he had seen um, demonstrated in a series of different industries in the States. And they all focused on um, customer service and patient service. And, and Brian, in his inimitable way, said, I've got a million quid, which in those days was a huge amount of money. It's still a good deal of money now, but it's a huge amount of money. And Brian said, I've got a million pounds, um, come forward with some outrageous projects. So um, I, then, um, I then wrote to our clinical directors and other senior colleagues within the Leicester Royal Infirmary, which is where I was at, and said, well, have you guys got any ideas as to what you might do? And a fabulous neurologist called Dr. Paul Millack came forward and said, Peter, I've, uh, I've got this, um, this idea of a single visit clinic, which will uh, transform a process for um, um, neurology outpatients that typically takes four or five visits, 12 to 14 weeks in terms of cycle time, uh, into one single visit. And I said, well, okay, Paul, we'll give it a go. And we had the remarkable uh, force of nature, Helen Bevan, uh, uh, in the organisation, one of the best appointments I've ever been involved in. Uh, and Helen, as ever, with, uh, with her characteristic energy, ensured we put this project into place in a matter of two or three weeks. And it transformed things. And what we did, and Helen was simultaneously um, reading some uh, literature uh, recommended by a learning set she was involved in in Manchester. Uh, and one of the set texts uh, was the lean machine in terms of uh, the automotive industry and also Michael Hammer's uh, uh, re-engineering a manifesto for revolution. And, and Helen, um, characteristically, then came to me after having read these books and said, Peter, Peter we need to re-engineer the entire hospital. Um, and I, I thought this involved some sort of plumbing exercise. Um, <laughs> and what Helen uh, did is with some friends within the hospital, she basically did a process map of the pre-existing neurology clinic, which was antediluvian and was utterly uncustomer, unstaff friendly, uh, into the single visit clinic, which significantly simplified the whole arrangement and provided a much better experience for patients, for staff, for students, in that students could see the complete uh, diagnostic um, cycle through to um, um, recommending a plan of action wherever that was possible for the patient in one half day. And we studied this and um, uh, were at the same time facing enormous financial challenges. And we recognised, well, if we could apply these principles to the entire organisation, let alone the entire system, we would truly achieve better quality at lower cost. But what are you personally most proud of achieving? What I'm most proud of achieving, um, Sarah, is a set of lessons that I've always applied subsequently. And that's the potency of focusing on the patient and listening to staff. But if we focus and follow a patient through a system, a healthcare system, what we'll see most usually are 
uh, remarkable results being achieved by staff in spite of the system rather than because of it. And the insight that um, Dr. Millack uh, and Helen and others in Leicester provided me, and I like to think a wider community as well, um, is um, if we actually design the system around the patient requirement, most usually we'll achieve far better quality at lower cost with far greater satisfaction for staff. And that trinity is as relevant now as it was then. One thing we, that I remember um, warmly is we had a minister visit us uh, at Leicester Royal Infirmary um, in order to find out a bit more about the work we were doing on the patient process redesign. And in preparation for the minister's visit, uh, um, Helen, Helen Bevan came up with a genius idea, so often she does, um, of doing a process map of a before and after a picture of a process that would happen to be a routine tonsillectomy procedure, which included outpatients and, uh, uh, and the surgical procedure. The before process map literally had to be uh, um, sellotaped onto a roll of wallpaper. It was like um, a very complicated spaghetti tree. It was remarkable the patient got care of the end of the, the, uh, the process and the after was on a single side of A4. And so when the minister visited us, we, uh, we shared this uh, with him and uh, um, he uh, was immediately attracted by the compelling case that we presented. And of course it was so much better for patients, uh, for students, for staff and indeed save money. And um, he told us when we met him several months later that he, um, he then took this, uh, this comparative process um, set of charts uh, around um, um, the Department of Health at Richmond House and indeed Whitehall, uh, commending civil servants to consider applying the same disciplines to their own work. But it was a very helpful example and learning for me in terms of uh, providing um, uh, graphic evidence to others who have very little time to show the compelling case that uh, service improvement and process redesign offers. The, the many insights that we gained in Leicester, and it took us some time, um, is the, the potency of learning. Um, and learning in terms of the application of uh, improvement methods for, for all of us, including frontline clinical staff. And what I hadn't anticipated uh, is the hugely important um, change that uh, when an individual becomes fluent with the application of um, process improvement um, tools and techniques and most usually in, as part of a multidisciplinary team, it changes them. And I've learned that organisations only transform if individuals within them transform. And the application of uh, a thoughtful learning not only results uh, in improved um, services for patients and for staff, it also qualitatively helps the individual gain greater confidence in terms of understanding uh, a, uh, the best solution to the problems that on an everyday basis are presented. And too often we take um, short-term answers to long-term questions. And what service improvement learning and application teach us is to take long-term answers to long-term problems. And what about some of your biggest challenges? What were some of those and how did you overcome them? Well, I, I did my, uh, my doctorate on um, the re-engineering programme, as, as you know, Sarah, and so I reread the, the final chapter, which is Chief Executive as Management Researcher, which I um, burdened you with. And the, the challenges that um, appeared at the time to be daunting um, included making sure the board was on board with this, because um, the chairman, Philip Hammersley, was an absolute supporter. Without that, it would have been um, dead in the water. But Philip was a hugely strong supporter. He had seen some of these principles applied in the private sector and was keen to make sure we did that uh, intelligently in, in the NHS. Um, it was making sure we had enough money so we could invest in the dedicated teams uh, to bring in expertise from um, other sectors uh, outside of health to help us uh, undertake this and getting the system to support it. Um, so it did require a fair amount of, um, of stakeholder encouragement and uh, management, um, which I'd never done before in that, that scale. Um, and what was interesting is um, every solution has a time in which it's well received. And the fact the NHS was in such a financial challenged position 
I mean, that when I went through to uh, Alan Langlands, now Sir Alan Langlands, who was the deputy chief exec at that stage, became chief exec of the NHS, and described to him, uh, well, Alan, we have an experiment here that may have national significance. To his immense credit, and very few senior managers would have done that, he backed us. And we took a loan um, of some considerable sum of money, four and a half million pounds in those days, yeah. which we undertook to pay back. Um, and that, again, required the board to be confident in, um, in the exercise. Uh, and um, we then pressed ahead with um, what ended up being a, a programme work that, that extended over several years. So in 1999, you left Leicester and took up a national role. And I then um, moved to work uh, for the Chief Executive of the NHS for a couple of years, um, helping with achieving the Labour government's waiting list targets. So that involved a, the application of, of process redesign uh, and we had a number of colleagues, including Helen uh, Bevan, a number of other colleagues that worked with many, many hospitals and systems up and down the country applying process redesign, which was a really exciting programme of work. Uh, and then I went to Chai, the Commission for Health Improvement, as you rightly say. What was your key learning from working for Chai? Mm. That was a huge privilege in that with Dame Deirdre Hine, the chair, and with the fabulous Dr Jocelyn Cornwall, we set an organisation up from scratch literally recruiting everyone from scratch. And for the first couple of years, uh, Justin and I were personally involved in all the appointments. And what we learnt there, um, principally, when we set the organisation up, is the power, potency and value of values. Where not only did we recruit for skills, we recruited for values. And it notes me when you set up a new organisation which covers two countries, England and Wales, um, there are a lot of novel problems that present themselves. Um, and I remember quite a few of them very well. And we had um, a, uh, a default response whenever we faced a novel problem. They said, well, what do our values tell us we should do? And that was a very helpful sort of satellite navigation through some really quite challenging uh, problems. So the, the value of values was a central uh, plank of, of my learning uh, and my apprenticeship of a, as a senior manager and leader. Okay. And since Chai, you've been back working as a chief executive and uh, for the last 10 years as chief exec um, at Nottingham University Hospitals. And um, how have you approached things differently in Nottingham from what you did in Leicester? Uh, we did a, a major benchmarking exercise to understand where, as a recently merged organisation, we were strong, where we were weak internationally using international benchmarks. Uh, and then we then um, designed and implemented a major um, um, quality improvement program called Better For You. Uh, and we resourced it, and we, uh, the board agreed that we would put in something over four and a half million pounds per annum, which we've maintained, and the payback on that is formidable. The financial return on investment is very significant and positive on each year. But I would argue much more importantly than that is the emotional return on the investment from staff and from patients in that what we have seen over the past uh, now six years since the programme has been in place in a mature form is notwithstanding the huge pressures that staff face uh, is growing self-possession and confidence in being able to solve problems at their root as opposed to what often happens in the NHS that the solutions get delegated upwards and then um, someone who's very remote from the problem ends up taking a decision which almost certainly is wrong. So we've seen a significant return on investment in terms of uh, the financial investment uh, and savings and productivity improvements, but very, very importantly, encouraging staff to feel, if you like, um, not so much um, organisational uh, um, uh, subjects, but organisational citizens and ultimately organisational leaders. A facet uh, of the um, uh, um, uh, overall improvement uh, program, uh, Better For You, is the Just Do It program. Uh, and this is uh, supported uh, in a very, very welcome way by the NUH charity, which provides uh, uh, a modest uh, but very important um, sum of money on an annual basis. So staff, when they join, when they, they um, identify an improvement, um, a quick fix, if you will, um, they submit it um, to a team that we have which is attached to the Better For You programme uh, and if we can we implement the idea within a handful of days. Most usually these ideas cost nothing or a very low cost. Sometimes they require a bit of equipment uh, and we've had several thousand of these improvement projects in place. 
uh, and on a uh, six monthly basis the uh, the board has the privilege of meeting uh, very many um, uh, contributors uh, for us to say thank you to the members of staff and it's always a humbling experience to learn of the improvements that uh, staff have uh, introduced. It's also very chastening in that sometimes what staff are having to do is to fix problems um, which reflect organisational stupidities. And it's very humbling to realise, notwithstanding the fact we like to think we're reasonably well organised and reasonably well managed, there's still a huge scope for improvement and very often again staff achieve good results in spite of the systems rather than because of them. Um, and if I may, the other lesson that we applied in Nottingham compared to Leicester is we have a formal uh, faculty of improvement specialists, um, uh, multidisciplinary doctors, nurses, allied health professional scientists, managers and, and others uh, and they act as a, um, a, a resident resource that, uh, that helps support the various improvement programmes that we have. So as a busy chief exec both in Leicester, now in Nottingham, how have you found the space and resilience to keep working on improvement? What I learnt in Leicester is um, a fundamental part of the chief executive's role is as chief role model. And if the chief executive doesn't apply themselves to improvement, why should he or she expect others to? As a mentor once said to me, Peter, there's always a better way. And if we ask patients and we ask staff, they'll tell us what that, uh, that way is. And the role of the chief executive is to encourage, to nurture, to support um, the, ex the, the, the fulsome expression and implementation of the advice that patients and staff will, uh, will bring to us in a structured way so that we can share good ideas across the organisation as opposed to a series of hermetically sealed individual projects and codifying the learning and making it clear that in a gentle uh, but very clear way, an expectation for all leaders and indeed over time all staff is to improve services, not simply to maintain them. What's kept you personally resilient? Well, I, I think what's kept me resilient, um, Sarah, is the privilege of working in organisations that care for others, sometimes in the most joyful times of their lives, sometimes in the most tragic and as a chief executive, having a small part to play in enabling others to do the exquisitely difficult job of caring for patients. And working with some fantastic colleagues. And when I look back, I'm going to retire later this year, I truly consider myself privileged to have worked with some wonderful colleagues. And, um, and when one does that, it's a source of uh, abundant energy. I think one of the responsibilities of a leader which often isn't um, focused upon is to lead themselves. A leader can't lead others until they can lead themselves, by which I mean they need to understand the environments in which they flourish and the environments in which they struggle. And so for me, um, well my favourite definition of leadership development is being oneself more skillfully. And it's taken me about 20 years to get a, an initial grasp of what that means for me. And for me, uh, there are three domains, mind, body and soul. And notwithstanding the often really quite oppressive challenges that we all face as part of our, um, our, uh, our duties, uh, I know that unless I give sufficient airtime to those three domains, mind, body and soul, uh, then um, certain sources of energy extinguish. So it includes for me making sure I read very broadly, uh, making sure I take a, a range of exercise. Uh, uh, and so for this year, uh, partly to celebrate my 60th birthday, I'm determined to complete six half marathons, one full marathon and three long distance bike rides, mm -hmm. uh, all sponsored. Um, so I'll be around with the sponsorship forms shortly uh, right. to viewers. Um, and and soul, um, which means connecting with family and friends. And I do recognise those, those moments in my career which have been the darkest have been those moments when those three domains haven't featured as they should. What would be the key advice you would give to new leaders of improvement coming up? My advice to, to leaders um, with the exciting and sometimes daunting prospects of a career ahead of them is... Um, become fluent with the tools, techniques of service improvement. 
always learn from others. Learn from outside the industry in which we work. Learn internationally. And always, always listen to others. And make sure that um, the organisation or the teams for which you're responsible do truly apply the principles of service improvement, including consistent application of um, team and organisational values. The other aspects I would um, offer, Sarah, is that the system, including the regulatory environment, needs to be as concerned with service improvement as providers are expected to be. Because without a propitious supportive environment, the energy and the productivity of service improvement can get extinguished.